um, hearing from our two presenters, I just wanted to um, to say a few words about um, the context and the presentation that we're uh, going to hear about today. I think I have just a few, very few slides. Um, so the context in which this uh, webinar is taking place is basically, um, well, we, with the recent waves of large-scale land acquisition and in general increase of commercial agriculture in, in low and uh, middle income country and, and in Africa in particular, there, there, is an incre there are increasing pressures on, uh, on land uh, which result themselves in uh, pressures on communities' rights and, and livelihoods. And initial research uh, uh, showed that often these pressures result in differentiated impacts on on men and women, and um, often women are more negatively affected than, than men. Um, and today we're going to focus um, specifically on the case of, um, of Tanzania. Um, this is where our two presenters come in. Uh, Helen Dancer is, is going to first give us a bit of a uh, context uh, with the Tanzania situation. Um, in particular, looking at the impacts of uh, commercial agriculture in Tanzania. Um, and she is going to base herself on some field research that she has undertaken um, in the Kilombera district in Tanzania, uh, where um, there is some uh, sugarcane production um, going on. Um, and then we're going to hear uh, from Naziku. Um, so uh, the idea is to have one, first the, the context, and then basically Tola is a Tola is a Tanzanian um, NGO who um, focuses on gender, and um, we're going to hear how from their experience on how uh, they try to give more voices to women and increase their participation, in particular um, in relation to um, decision-making processes at the village level on land governance issues. Um, and they have developed a tool for that, which is basically aimed at mainstreaming gender in village bylaws. Um, so I will now give the floor to Helen from her presentation. And, uh, and then we hear from Nazeku afterwards. Thanks very much, Philippine, for that um, kind introduction. Um, in this presentation, I just want to introduce you all to a couple of key themes and issues concerning women's participation in commercial agriculture. And as Philippine said, I want to draw particularly upon some field work that Emmanuel Sule and I conducted in um, southern Tanzania. Um, sorry, just to go back a step. The slide seems to have gone on by itself. Um, so, why is this an important issue now? Well, as the uh, Philippines said, um, there's, a, there's a real growth in commercial agriculture across um, Africa, and there's really a need to pay careful attention to the impact that this has on men and women and their ability to participate in agribusiness. But another important lesson that um, that I learned from the field work that, that I, I want to emphasize in this presentation is that I think it's really important that we try to um, challenge and change um, a, a discourse of marginalization of women um, in terms of their participation um, towards a, a belief that promotes and believes in women's um, participation and a discourse that promotes that. Um, uh, the reason why I say this is because I was really inspired by one particular woman who uh, Emmanuel and I met during our fieldwork in Kilombero, who was the chairwoman of a, a local cane growers association. And she was the only female of 15 chairpersons of a local cane growers association. Uh, when we met her, she said she's often asked why women don't contest for leadership positions. And she said there's really no simple answer to that. In the context of sugarcane, which is a really capital-intensive crop, um, 
women obviously need access to land, they need access to capital in order to be able to participate in the, um, in, in the, the uh, commercial agriculture. But also, she said, it's really important to move away from this idea that women can't do it to, towards a new system where we believe women can. And when she said that, she quoted the Swahili saying, Chereko, Chereko, na mwenye mwana, you have to be part of the dance. So this is a, a message I, I really hope that we'll take away from today's session. Um, just turning to the legal and policy context, um, there's, there's a real drive in Tanzania towards uh, large-scale agriculture, and that really began with Kilimo Kwanza Agriculture First back in 2009, and since then various policies have followed on from that. Um, the Southern Agricultural Growth Corridor of Tanzania and Big Results Now are really promoting uh, uh, increased um, investment in uh, rice and, and the large-scale sugarcane production. And then in the legal context, there are some very positive laws that promote women's equal rights to land. Uh, the Land Act and the Land Act of 1999, which recognise men and women have <coughs> equal rights to, oh, excuse me, <coughs> equal rights to hold, use, and deal with land. And there are other provisions concerning women's participation in land governance, which, um, which uh, will be more part of Mesiku's uh, presentation than mine. But what we need to consider is what happens in practice. Um, and what happens in practice is actually determined by a, a real range of factors. Um, there is no one single factor that um, affects whether or not a woman can participate in commercial agriculture. You have to look at the level of the individual, their socioeconomic status within the community, um, their age, their gender, their um, uh, educational background. Um, you need to look at how uh, resources are distributed within the household. Um, you need to look at the local context. Um, the, the customary laws or norms that uh, may, may um, prevail in a particular area, and local trends in terms of migration, um, and the way that land is accumulated within a particular area. And then you need to look at the national context and the kind of um, policies and laws that uh, may be promoting uh, or not um, equal participation. And then at a particular business level, um, you need to look at what um, is required in order for men and women to actually access the particular business. Do they have to own their own land in order to be able to um, participate as outgrowers, for example? You need to look at the type of agribusiness. Is this a plantation where people are mostly, mostly employees, or is it contract farming, or is it a kind of a block, commercial block arrangement? And then uh, participation will vary depending on the crop type. Um, and the, the ways in which men and women's roles are seen to be um, gendered within, the, within a particular business, the working conditions and contracts that companies offer, and how men and women link with global value change. So you have to take all of these factors into account when you're thinking about how men and women participate in commercial agriculture. So turning to the... Um, the study that uh, Emmanuel and I did in Kilombero, uh, we did this, it was a short study in uh, 2014. And we picked Kilombero because it's the largest commercial sugar producer in Tanzania and it's located within the Sakot um, project area, which is really a focus of um, uh, Tanzania's policy on commercial agriculture. This is a company that operates with both a plant, large nucleus plantation estate, but also a large number of um, independent outgrowers who uh, supply their sugar cane to the company um, for, for uh, processing. And what was a very interesting and important feature of this area was that some of the villages uh, were Ujamaa villages, so African socialist villages, that um, had a long-standing history of allocating land to both men and women um, villages um, on, a, on an equal basis. And those villages were also the subject of pilot land titling schemes. So what we found uh, in this particular study is uh, perhaps an exception to the rule, but which might point the way towards 
how men and women can participate more equally in agriculture in the future. Um, so in this particular study, as you can see, there was uh, quite a spread of ways in which men and women could acquire land in these villages. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the villages had a policy of allocating land to both men and women villages on an equal basis. Also, some land was inherited, some land was purchased, uh, people rented land as well. It was a very buoyant um, local land market. Um, and it was increasingly common for women to inherit land upon their husband's death and to be registered as cane growers with associations as a consequence of that. And whilst it's true that men tended to hold larger plots than the um, women on the whole, uh, in our own study, uh, we, we went to three cane growers associations and uh, um, looked at their figures in detail. And on average, about 42% of registered outgrowers in those three cane growers associations were women, which is quite a bit higher than, um, than the figures that have been reported in other studies. Um, and this has a knock-on effect in terms of land titling, because in that area there was a pilot land titling taking place. And our preliminary findings from that suggested that um, women's names were likely to appear on the majority of titles, whether as um, joint, um, joint owners or as sole owners. Um, so that was a positive uh, early indication um, that, uh, again, is not typical of um, patterns of women's access to uh, land and uh, land titling elsewhere. Um, I, I am conscious that I'm running out of time, so I just want to quickly address um, the other point that I wanted to make today, which is about men and women in the employed workforce. And there's been a trend in uh, commercial agriculture uh, for towards privatization, mechanization, and a casualization of the employed labor force. And these statistics from the, the Kilambero study um, really graphically illustrate how um, privatization has led to a massive decline um, in employment generally. The, the workforce in 2013 as compared to 1992 is one quarter of its original size. But you can also see that there has been a disproportionate impact on women's employment um, because of a relative decline in, in permanent jobs in favor of seasonal and non-permanent employment. And that reflects the, the pattern of um, the, the, the type of work that men and women do within the workforce. Um, another important point to make about employment is that just 9% of managers um, at uh, this particular company were women, and they were mostly first-line managers. So there's a real need to promote uh, women's participation in the employed workforce, and in particular in leadership positions. Um, so just to, just to wrap up, uh, I know that um, Naseku will be talking more about participation in land governance next, um, but I, I think it's important in the context of commercial agriculture to really address this, the gender disparity that exists. Um, and you have to do this by looking at multiple levels of individual, household, local, community, national level, and type of business, as I said before. But then I finally want to return to the point that was made by the, the Cane Growers Association chairwoman that um, we really need to change the discourse on participation and uh, <laughs> enable both women and men to be part of the dance. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen. And uh, as, you, um, as soon as you're ready. Um, thank you very much, Terry, uh, and thank you very much, Helen, for our introduction about the situation in Tanzania. And my presentation will focus on strengthening women's participation in governance and the administration of land through by laws. And of course, I'm going to focus specifically on Taula initiatives towards promoting gender equity for decision making at the very local level, much as in the standard have to do a lot of advocacy even at the national level. And okay, I'm going to talk about uh, the situation towards control and ownership of land in Tanzania. I know Helen has highlighted. And as we know that much as women are predomin predominantly small-scale farmers in Tanzania, 
their right to land remains weak. And with the increase of commercial pressures on land investments, their right to land becomes even weaker due to weak governance frameworks, effective legal frameworks, but also the patriarchal system, which continues to dominate actions towards women access control and ownership of land. And also on issues of decision-making processes, as introduced earlier, as Taula is a professional group of women lawyers in Tanzania, and our focus is promotion of women rights. We have a number of uh, legislation that we rely on as a backup to promote women rights. And specifically on land issues, first of all, we have the Constitution of Tanzania, which talks about the uh, equality and participation in decision making. We have uh, Progressive Land Act, number four and five. We have the local government, the local government district authority, and I've mentioned this because uh, we focus on, most of the time, we, we focus on rural women. We focus on rural women, and uh, and so the village, uh, the village is very, very important. And as we know, the local government district authority act provides for the governance of the village of the village council. And we also have a national land policy which talks about equality and of course the international human rights and policies. But we are also aware that we have um, it's uh, it's also uh, obvious that we we still have like the blind rules specifically the bylaws and the procedures, much as uh, much as we have like uh, different bylaws governing like different issues, we have clear procedures, but they are gender blind. That is, they don't highlight uh, gender issues. And Taula looks at this uh, from uh, various angles. First of all, uh, legal and policy analysis which informs our advocacy work towards reforms, and then the implementation gaps of the existing provisions which safeguard women's rights. And uh, our focus is to strengthen the regulatory framework, starting uh, with the village, uh, at the village level, and also engage the community in the processes, because as you understand, is, uh, the organization focuses on women's rights, so women are our primary beneficiaries. And also, we focus on awareness raising. And today, my presentation will uh, will focus on the bylaw, which is our which is a developed tool. And I must say that uh, for the tool that I'm going to talk about today on decision village bylaws, focusing on decision making processes, they were developed in partnership with uh, its Taula in partnership with World Resource Institute and the LIT, that is Lawyers Lawyers Environmental Action Team. And the bylaws, um, the bylaws are rules enacted by an authorized organ to govern its own procedures. And we have different types of bylaws governing different issues. We have uh, bylaws governing the, uh, village, the, uh, the proceedings of the village council, and this is what we are focused on because uh, of uh, we focus on the decision making processes. We also have bylaws on land use planning. We have bylaws on environmental conservation. So we have uh, different type of bylaws. And in Tanzania, uh, this is the bylaws are provided under the Local Government District Authorities Act. Um, and uh, this has mandated the village council. For the village bylaws, the mandate is, uh, is on the village council, which has powers to make the village bylaws. So why did it why did we decide to focus on this? Because our aim was to establish a gender equitable and participatory regulatory framework. And I might say that uh, Taula, as Taula, first of all, we did like this was a, this was preceded by a research. We did a research. We did a lot of consultation to look at what are the gaps. Yes, we have the laws, but what are the implementation gaps? And then uh, we came up, as I said, in partnership with WRI and LEAP, we came up with principle by laws because. Uh, for our pilot project area, we already had uh, existing bylaws, so we had to look and analyze the bylaws and identify gaps. So uh, for the gaps that we, ident we have identified after the research, which consulted like different stakeholders, including women, 
including the leaders at the local government, including the local government leaders at the district level, we identified uh, several features for the bylaws. Uh, the first feature, which was really important for us, is uh, the gender quotas in leadership that uh, through the, go the government organ in the village council, in the village government, so that is the village council, the village committees, the village land, the village land council, which is specifically for district settlements. And then another feature was men-to-men uh, -men rotation of leadership, that is in the uh, leadership in village chairperson, village land councils, and even chairs in different committees that are established under the village council. And then 50% of men and women in the council and committees, that is 50-50, uh, that is equal representation. We also uh, suggested this so as to to, to give, like, to, to promote, because we didn't have to, to say that we're looking at the ratio or something else. We wanted to, to, to ensure that we promote women participation in different decision making processes, and especially at the village council, because uh, most of the time they have uh, decisions that from there before they go to the village assembly, which is the uh, highest decision making organ in the village, uh, at the village. Also, specific quorum, another feature for village assembly meeting. This is depending on the number of adult villagers and according to the ratio of men and women in the village. And we wanted equal representation of both gender and passing decision. So this will depend on the number of adult villagers in the village to, to have a ratio of men and women so as to promote equal representation. Uh, the other feature is meeting quorum should be equally composed of men and men in all meet that is in all meetings the village assembly the village councils and even the committees so those are the features which was, were introduced in order to to promote participation of women in decision making processes and how did we go about it what is the process uh first of all when we, we developed the principle by laws we did um Consultation with different with different groups, including women themselves, to identify to identify gaps and what are the issues. Because uh, we needed to ask them why don't why don't they attend meetings? Why don't they participate meaningful in the village councils? What the why don't they attend the committees meetings? Because most of the time, even if we go for our community for community conversation, which we which we always target the quarterly village meet village assembly women, you find the number of women is low, so we had to do like a lot of this consultation before we even uh, propose the principle by laws. So we consulted with the, uh, with the village leaders, women groups, men leaders, paralegals, and just trying to reach like everyone. And then uh, after the consultation, we did like stakeholders meeting with other civil society organizations, which has worked on the same issues. The academia just and to ensure that it, it is workable and it will this really help women and then after the meeting with different stakeholders uh, which we went to the government now local but also national for the local government we targeted the uh, district level and uh, we uh, we invited them together the uh, officials at the district level as well as the village chairman and some other leaders from the village council this is uh, to introduce the bylaws to have first of all a gender, gender, a gender, uh, a gender brush like sensitization of you know, gender to ensure that why do we need this kind of bylaws and how is this going to help uh, promoting women, uh, promote women participation in decision making. So uh, we did a number of consultation meetings uh, for this specific bylaw. We, we had like three different meetings with that at the district level. They gave us an input, they gave recommendations, and uh, and also like guidance, because at the end of the day, it's the district council which approved laws. So we also had like input from people from the Ministry of uh, of Land and the Ministry of uh, of Ministry of uh, uh, Local Government, Local Government, Regional and Local Government. To get their input, and then we took the bylaws to the village council. 
because the, the, village, the village council is the one having, having power to, uh, to, to, to propose the bylaws. Uh, then after there, then the process continues. It's approval by the village assembly because they have to, to, they have to agree. And then uh, is the, the main decision-making organ in the, in the village. And the bylaws here can be passed by uh, with or without amendment. And, that's, uh, and sometimes we can get inputs. But for this, because they are, the villagers were, in, were involved, there was a lot of consultation before, so they are aware of the issue. Um, and then uh, uh, the bylaws uh, went to the village council to work on the input. But uh, for this particular one, there was no input with Taula, who's the assistant from Taula. And then the village council forwarded the bylaws for approval to the district council. Uh, and when the, they forwarded the, uh, the bylaws well, with, with the minutes of the village assembly to show that who attended the meeting when this, uh, when this decision was passed. Now I'll, sh I'll talk about the use and reflection of the bylaw. First of all is to promote good governance at the village level to ensure that the village, uh, the village government are there to good principles of good governance, such as gender equality, uh, rule of law, and all that. And then, and also transparency in the anti-corruption issues, because we have faced a number of issues related to that. And also provision to safeguard women participation in key decision-making processes, uh, generate new knowledge, and the demand to safeguard gender in the, in the administrative village council. And then participatory buy-in. Participatory buy-in from the community members because they were involved from the beginning. And then collaboration with the local government, for instance, the, dis the district council, which, uh, which approves the bylaws. And, uh, and the, uh, what... what uh, before I go to what to the next, next I wanted to highlight um, the lesson learned from the from lessons learned from from, from these processes. Uh, first of all, we still have uh, to do a lot of gender sensitization, and I understand that it's not only at the local at the local level, but even at the national level, but. Uh, generation is very important. Um, we 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 saw that we faced that challenge when we went to district level initially and to the local to the local leaders. And then the community participation is very important because we have seen that the support because they are involved from the beginning and they they were concerned to see the importance of this. And then um, one to one meetings with key people like the uh, district executive director, the district lawyer village chairman and even the leaders of the village council. So um, what are the next steps? Scaling up to other, uh, to other areas to ensure that there is a uh, uh, promotion of, of uh, gender equitable participation of, uh, of both gender and decision making processes, but also advocacy at the national level to adopt the model by laws. This is targeting the minister, the, the responsible minister, which is the prime minister's office, regional and local government authority. And because the relevant minister has been given powers by the local government act, to uh, uh, the local government, the local government act has provided for powers for the minister to make uniform village by laws in respect of village. Or a category of category of villages. So we want to do a lot of advocacy to ensure that this becomes a model by law and it can be adopted in other villages. And then review existing bylaws to mainstream gender because most of the bylaws for different issues are really gender blind, such as the land use planning, and uh, environmental conservation, and all that. Um, so that is our next steps what we want to do next. Thank you very much.